Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Matt Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. As we sit here today, the opportunity set is poor for lots of traditional asset classes, stocks, bonds, even the private markets. Diversification can be your best friend, and one way to diversify your portfolio is through alternative assets. If you want to invest in something with typically low correlation to the stock market, consider a real but overlooked asset, art. After all, the ultra-high net worth individuals have stored their wealth in art for generations. In fact, I've diversified my portfolio by investing in several paintings through the Masterworks platform, and I've loved my experience too. I wasn't surprised when I read on TechCrunch about Masterworks' recent valuation estimate over a billion dollars. They make investing in paintings like Picasso, Warhol, and Banksy easy and cost-effective. And Masterworks has given my listeners priority access to skip to the front of the wait list. Some of their offerings have sold out in hours, so don't wait. Just go to masterworks.io slash meb. That's masterworks.io slash meb. See you there. How I Invest in 2022. Today's podcast is an update to a piece we originally penned back in 2020. It was the third article in a four-part series written during the pandemic. The first part was the Get Rich Portfolio. Part two was the Stay Rich Portfolio. Part three, which is the topic today, How I Invest My Money, followed by part four, Investing in the Time of Corona. I would encourage you to go back and take a look at all of those for reference. In the first two pieces, we discussed strategies for generating riches and then preserving them. We hold some pretty non-consistent views on these topics, and I urge you to read those articles first before continuing to listen here. You can also read a list of my 16 non-consistent market views on Twitter, see how many of those you can agree with. We'll add the link in the show notes. Our third piece attempts to provide an illustration of how to combine these strategies in a real-world, real-time portfolio, my own. This is an extension of a piece I've been writing for years, namely, how I invest my own money. I began noticing an interest in this topic from readers years ago, usually as December rolled into January of a new year. I suppose some investors found it useful to see how someone whose career and investments allocated their money. Others perhaps found the process instructive for application of their own portfolio, or perhaps they just like to watch from the stand so they can cheer on or throw tomatoes virtually on Twitter. What's important is you find an approach that works for you. From the late, great John Bogle, that was low-cost index investing. And he said, I quote, To repeat, while such an index-driven strategy may not be the best investment strategy ever devised, the number of investment strategies that are worse is infinite. End of quote. Will my strategy be the best devised or the best strategy for everyone? Absolutely not. But is it the best strategy for me? I think so. With that in mind, let's pull back the curtain. Of course, there's nothing too dramatic about what's behind this curtain. As I mentioned a moment ago, I've been publicly detailing what I do with my money for years, and I'm happy to continue doing so. But first, a couple of disclaimers before we launch in. First, the reality is this information shouldn't matter to anyone outside my family. And to be honest, no one ever listens to what I say in the podcast anyway. However, I recognize that many investors appreciate the thoughts behind the process, either as a template for their own portfolio or just to stir up some questions for debate. That said, please understand I'm not offering this information as a recommendation for how you should invest personally. My situation is not yours. And even if it were, there are a million different market approaches that work just fine. The challenge, of course, is avoiding the 10 million approaches that are terrible. The numbers are not exact. Forget about decimal points. Attempting to provide that degree of specificity would be pointless. Furthermore, the most instructive part of the exercise is simply understanding how the big financial pieces fit together to create a holistic financial portrait. So specifics aren't that helpful. Third, this podcast tends to be a bit anticlimactic for many investors, since I'm aware most investors looking to get a read on how to position their portfolios are thinking about stocks specifically. I'll provide you with 100% transparency about how my investments are positioned, but you'll see this doesn't materially change from one year to the next, as most of the funds do all the work and adjustments for me. So unfortunately, I have no hot stock tips for you in this podcast. Though if you want to gossip about investments and ideas over a meal or beverage, hit me up. I'm always game. 
Finally, you'll see that I'm somewhere in between when it comes to wealth generation and wealth preservation strategies. I have a young family with plenty of financial needs, so I'm still trying to generate wealth. On the other hand, I'm trying to be thoughtful about my family's financial future, so that means certain preservation strategies as well. And as I mentioned before, I really like to sleep soundly. Again, this is what works for me at the moment, which will change over time, and I don't hold it out as a suggestion for any specific reader or listener to follow. It's merely an illustration. Enough intro, let's jump right in. The biggest pieces of my net worth. The vast majority of my net worth is concentrated in entrepreneurial ventures I founded, namely in my asset management company, Cambria, and my research company, The Idea Farm. While the exact percentage is open to debate, it's likely somewhere between 50 and 99%. While not quite as extreme as Elon Musk's, if Tesla and SpaceX go bankrupt, so will I, as it should be, quote, the ownership stakes in my companies are the largest determinants of my net worth. This is likely true for many business owners around the world. Echoing our prior essays on getting rich and staying rich, I think it's useful to bucket my holdings into these two categories. Being a founder and owner of Cambria and the Idea Farm fall into the get-rich bucket. That having been said, if you exclude Cambria and the Idea Farm, my largest holdings are about 40% each in real assets like housing and farmland, investments in 300-plus private startup companies, and the remainder in my public investment portfolio. Now, I would would like the split to be closer to 33% each over time, but due to some appreciation and some developments we'll detail later, they have drifted somewhat out of balance. All you historians will recognize this allocation as approximating the 2,000-year-old Talmud portfolio we've mentioned many times on the podcast that is spread equally across real assets, businesses, and safe reserves. You can, of course, download a free copy of our Global Asset Allocation book with chapters on various allocations, including the Talmud portfolio. Be on the lookout, hopefully, for a second edition in 2022, you can go to mebfavor.com or Cambria Investments to pick up a free ebook copy. Let's unpack those categories. First, farmland is a generally pretty stable income producing asset and is about as non correlated as you can get to the rest of the portfolio. So I put that in the stay rich bucket. It offers very real sentimental and emotional value for me personally due to some family roots in the area. Plus, if you ever want to seriously disconnect with some quiet time, there's really no better place. Or if you want to shoot guns, drive around ATVs, or just not be bothered by anyone. And when the public markets are going haywire, you can take some solace that land values don't update minute by minute, second by second. I posted a picture on the show notes of me trying to figure out a farmland winner up or down a few years ago, which is just me wandering through a beautiful wheat field. So if you guys ever want to do a meetup in Kansas at the Beehive, let me know. Now, the big update here in 2022 is I've reduced my direct farmland holdings Started to diversify into some of the farm platforms we mentioned on Acre Trader and Farm Together. I like having the connection to my family and roots in the Midwest, but the challenge is farming is a big, huge pain in the butt. And like most of my family is aging out there, meaning the younger generation isn't interested in farming. Owning the land becomes less and less of a sentimental decision and more of a simply financial one. And if it's a financial only decision, I'd rather have someone else do all the hard work, while also being more diversified across both geography and crop. I plan on adding more farmland over the next couple of years, and maybe even totally divesting from my own direct holdings, TBD. Now, the big news is we also bought a house. Now, it's the same house I've been living in for quite a while, so it's not a lot of effort to pack up and move out. But along with that comes a mortgage, of course. I'm a first-timer here, and wow, what an antiquated and dumb process. My goodness. I'm glad I'm investing in a lot of startups hoping to disrupt the calcified real estate space. And the romance of home ownership evaporates quickly when one day you come home and see mushrooms growing out of the wall like we did recently. That having been said, we're really excited about it. Next up, I detail all my private angel investing journey over the years on a blog post and podcast we did called Journey to 100x. And I put this, of course, into the get rich bucket, though depending on the outcome, of course, could be the get poor bucket. But I believe that the long and indefinite holding periods for many of these and the big tax breaks are major benefits of this approach. Plus, it's a lot of fun, incredibly engaging, and you wake up every day a little more optimistic. Now, contrast that with the consistent negative geopolitical news flow and public markets. I've considered my investments so far as tuition, and while the performance hurdle for me is the U.S. stock market, the hope is the portfolio will do much better over time. As to the performance, it's hard to say, but of the 300 plus deals, in which I've participated to date, 
Most are still in their infancy. However, there have been about 26 exits, including four bankrupt zeros, 13 acquisitions, two IPOs, and seven with secondary liquidity. Together, these deals have produced an average total return of about 140% on dollars investor, about 40% compound returns, including the time held. Those are ballpark numbers. In my still open investments, there are a lot of follow-on rounds and even a few unicorns on paper, keyword being on paper. While these results so far are incomplete and produce a rosy view of angel investing, I'm very aware this period has been incredibly favorable for private angel equity investments. What's important in this endeavor is seeing it through a full cycle over the next decade. Believe me, I lived in San Francisco during the early 2000 decimation, so I'm sure I'll see a range of winners and losers. The biggest cash return so far was over a 20 bagger, which provided a good lesson in the power laws of private and public markets. Worth repeating here and sharing some good papers on public market power laws, and we'll put this in the show notes from Bessenbinder, JP Morgan, Vanguard, Longboard, and the Chris Meyer podcast for more information on power laws. It's a little bit different mindset when you can't sell an investment, of course. Had my money been invested in a public stock, what are the odds? I would have sold after a double or triple. I'm going to say high to very high. While the concept of buying and holding a stock for the long run is a nice theory, it can be hard to implement in practice. I plan on continuing to allocate to startups over the next few years as opportunities present themselves. The nice feature of having invested over various vintages since 2014 is the portfolio now contains a spectrum of companies ranging from tiny 2 million market cap startups all well to established cash flowing decacorns worth over 10 billion. You can sign up for our email list to get updates on this topic in the future. On to the public investments. All right, let's turn to my public portfolio now. First, just a note to anyone reading this who has money in various funds or ETFs, which is most of us, ask any mutual fund manager why you should invest with them and you'll likely find yourself met with a barrage of sale points, all of which will underscore one takeaway. Their fund deserve lots of your money. But when you ask said manager what they do with their own money, it may surprise you. Often, many managers have zero dollars invest in their own fund. And we show this on the show notes, but we show a table with percent of managers have nothing, zero zip, invested alongside their client money they manage. And often those numbers are range from 40 to 80%. If you followed my blog and podcast for a while, you know where I'm headed. That's absurd. But I guess it shouldn't be surprising. The mutual fund industry has long been an area dominated by high fees, tax inefficiencies, sale loads, 12B1s, and other investor unfriendly practices. Maybe these fund managers are smart enough not to invest in their own funds they manage. But the world is wising up and investors are voting with their checkbooks and the fund flows tell the story. I think it's important to have skin in the game. If I don't believe in Cambria's funds enough to invest my own money here, why should anyone else? So for better or worse, I invest nearly all the public assets I manage into funds I control. Then I leave it on autopilot. Put that in the stay rich bucket. Even though the right portfolio is whatever lets you sleep at night, I prefer a moderate risk portfolio that targets higher returns than buy and hold with lower volatility and drawdowns, which is quite a tall order. So that translates into my current allocation of market-sensitive assets, which I've described many times before as buy and trend, or the Trinity strategy. So that's Trinity strategy is about half, tail risk about a quarter, foreign stocks about nine, cannabis eight, random stocks four, and collectibles three. We'll detail it here. The Trinity approach invests roughly half in a global strategic buy and hold asset allocation that is allocated across stocks, bonds, and real assets. The strategy includes tilts towards value and momentum instead of standard market capitalization weighted portfolios. The biggest problem to me for a buy and hold portfolio or strategy is that it's highly correlated to my own human capital and the economic cycle. When, tom when times are bad in the economy, this portfolio is also often doing poorly, the opposite of what most would prefer. The other half of the Trinity approach is invested in various trend-following strategies. The goal of these strategies is to reduce volatility and drawdowns, while still targeting similar returns to a buy-and-hold strategy, but with lower correlation. The hope is that trend zigs when buy-and-hold zags, and vice versa. The trend strategies tend to do well when markets are doing poorly, but are not easy to follow when times are good. There's no perfect strategy, of course, so I like the balance of allocating to both. This works for me because if you've read my blog or listened to podcasts for a while, you know I'm a trend follower at heart, yet also a value investor. This approach lets me scratch both itches. As a trend follower, I like the idea of having half my portfolio available to move to cash or hedges if markets trend down. 
Right now, many of these trend strategies are heavily exposed to real assets like commodities and real estate. These assets will hopefully protect the portfolio if the current inflation uptick is here to stay. But as a value investor, I want exposure to assets that may be cheap over long horizons, like what I believe foreign and emerging stock markets are currently. I get both with this approach. I want all my public investments totally on autopilot. I don't want to have to make trades or think about buying that cheap country when my emotions are arguing against it, thereby likely tripping me up. I don't want to have to think about selling that amazing market as the trend ends. In fact, I don't want to have to think about it at all. But I do want the funds and strategies to make all the adjustments for me in an objective, automated, and tax-efficient manner. This allocation includes what I consider to be my cash account. This is a big change for me over the years in my thinking. Namely, you should be investing at least some or all of your safe money. This is a hat tip to our friend Dan Egan of Betterment. Let's push my thinking ahead here. Earlier piece we did on the Stay Rich portfolio demonstrates that many investors believe to be the safest portfolio actually isn't. I believe when measured on a real after inflation basis, a cash account is as risky as a nice global asset allocation, but with much less return potential. So, I invest nearly all of the cash type investments I would have have in a broad allocation ETF and only retain a small amount for short-term living expenses. Next, you'll see an allocation to tail risk strategies. I consider this a hedge against my own career beta, as well as a hedge for all my private stock holdings. I plan to add a lot more, and I mean a lot more, if the stock market ever enters a downtrend again. The next slice is foreign funds, which represents some tax-exempt accounts that sadly have a limited allocation of funds, so I just toss them into what I see as the best low-cost investment I can find, which, as I write in podcast here, are foreign stock markets and emerging markets. There's a smidgen in cannabis, a theme I'm bullish on over the next decade. I detail my plans there a few years back and plan on adding more and more and more as cannabis stocks decline and decline and decline. I'm also bullish on other themes like Africa and space, and have been investing in private startups there, but we'll also make to look at allocation of public markets in the coming years. Lastly, there's some tiny amounts in rare coins, comic books, arts, collectibles. The rare coin allocation goes back to our Van Simmons podcast, which is a lot of fun if you haven't heard it. And that fits in the stay rich bucket and also the fun bucket. Comics, I probably held for 30 years. Thanks, mom. Fits into the fun bucket. I've also invested in a few paintings on podcast alum Masterworks. Crypto, well, that falls into what I call the regret minimization bucket. I'm not really attracted to crypto as an asset class, but I'd be willing to make an allocation in line with their market cap in the global market portfolio, which is about 0.5% currently, depending on what's going on in the world. That could be a long way away from there when this publishes. I do it mainly to avoid regret if the space ever goes up in value 100x and to quiet, of course, all my friends from badgering me if it does, well worth the sunk cost. Like many, I wish there were better public low-cost choices that I could hold or hodl, but fingers crossed, hopefully one day. I mentioned publicly a few times an interesting strategy could be to pick up shares of some of the closed-in funds as the discounts widen and widen and widen, and I'm considering that strategy for some allocations in the future. Now, in general, I find crypto companies to be vastly more interesting than cryptocurrencies themselves, and I've done about a dozen investments in the space. There we are. That's about it. Feel free to shoot me any thoughts and best of luck with your own investing journey. But let's end on an important note that is often overlooked in the countless hours we all spend on our investments. What's the point? Remember, money is only a means to an end. It's there to help you achieve your life goals and happiness. Does it help you fulfill your dream of travel? What about putting your grandkids through college? Perhaps it's there for you to support a local charity or social cause that's dear to you. Or maybe you want to help establish the next generation of entrepreneurs through capitalism. Or maybe you just want to fish with your friends. Whatever. Let the investments help you get there. Or the shorter version, my mom and grandma had a habit saying, look, you can't take it with you. And below is the longer version we've had on the blog since inception over a decade ago. This is a quote from George Mallory, Climbing Everest, the complete writings of George Mallory. People ask me, what is the use of climbing Mount Everest? And my answer must at once be, it is of no use. There is not the slightest prospect of any gain whatsoever. Oh, we may learn a little bit about the behavior of the human body at high altitudes. Possibly medical men may turn over their observation to some account for the purposes of aviation. But otherwise, nothing will come of it. We should not bring back a single bit of gold or silver, not a gem, nor any coal or iron. If you cannot understand that there is something in man which responds to the challenge of this mountain and goes out to meet it, that the struggle is the struggle of life itself, upward and forever upward, that you won't see why we go. 
What we get from this adventure is just sheer joy. And joy is, after all, the end of life. We do not live to eat and make money. We eat and make money and able to be able to live. That's what life means and what life is for. Met Faber is the co-founder and chief investing officer of Cambria Investment Management LP, Cambria, a registered investment advisor. Information set forth herein is for informational purposes only. It does not constitute financial investment, tax, or legal advice. Please see the appropriate financial professional for advice specific to your situation. There's no guarantee that a particular investing strategy will be successful. Opinions expressed herein are subject to change at any time. Past performance does not guarantee future results. All investments are subject to risks, including the risk of loss of principle.